What's up, everybody? We're back here. This hearing was contentious. This was a battle in the courtroom. And today we're going to take a look at that battle. Uh, nobody really won because the judge didn't make a decision, but we're going to look at what the defense's expert had to say about these surveys, about his reputation, about how tested they are, about how much they're used, why they are done this way, why they choose the questions they do. Then we're going to hear the state attack it on this specific case and why they think it's not right for this specific case and what they think should happen going forward. We are going to get to those points very specifically. We also hear uh, a bit of a trailer or a preview of what the defense's argument is going to be to change this venue. The state is going to withhold their argument for later. But most importantly, we start to get an idea of where Judge Judge stands on this specific issue. So lock in, get your questions ready, hit that like button if you guys haven't already, because we're going to jump into this video and this hearing now. All right, so the hearing is two and a half hours. We are not going to watch all two and a half hours. I've got maybe 50 to 60 minutes worth of clips we're going to watch here. Break it down. I'm going to recap and kind of summarize the stuff we don't watch together. I know a lot of you guys have watched this hearing, but to kind of drive the points home, I think it's important to play portions of the hearing so you can kind of get a feel for the arguments. And where everybody is, it's kind of interesting because they continue to say things like, I don't put any blame on the other side or anybody on that side of the table, but they continue to take shots they continue to be argumentative with each other. And while they're working so well together on this case, there are definitely issues that they've had to work through and things they just absolutely don't agree on. They're not going to agree on the questions on this survey. They're not going to agree on change of venue. They haven't agreed on a lot of discovery and DNA evidence and things like that. So from my perspective, there is a lot to battle through in this case. And basically the state was mad just start off the hearing because they weren't provided with everything ahead of time. They didn't get to go ever through everything ahead of time. They don't want this PowerPoint to be presented to everybody here. And for the world to see this PowerPoint, probably going to be inappropriate. And this is after the state read all the questions in the last hearing that they said were inappropriate for the world to hear and the media to run with. But that type of stuff happens. The judge ended up letting them use the PowerPoint, letting them go forward on this. The judge really wants, and this is what I like about Judge Judge. I know some people don't like Judge Judge, but he wants to get to the truth. He wants the information. He wants to hear from the expert. He wants to hear from the lawyers and he's going to do his best to make the right decision. I don't feel like he's been leaning towards either side this entire um, time dealing with this case. I really don't. So we're going to jump in as they start discussing what is public record and how does this affect the non-dissemination order and the survey and the things that are getting out in this case. I'll agree with that. No, no, no. You think the public record is whatever the media thinks out? Your Honor, I think it's what's in the public. And what's in the public is derived from the affidavit that supported probable cause to arrest Brian Koberger. That's the first document that the court finds in the, the whole cases of interest on Idaho State Supreme Court's website. That document has a ton of information in it that relate to the questions in the survey for the case-specific questions. So that document became public record, and that was spread far and wide all over the place and reported and interpreted repeatedly, repeatedly. So... She starts out by talking about the probable cause affidavit. I agree with her. That is public record. And we're going to hear from this expert. We're going to hear a lot from this expert. And I actually think I'm coming on board with more stuff. My, my view on this is changing a little bit, right? I'm not afraid to change my opinion if I hear from an expert or I hear some evidence. That's kind of how this stuff goes. We don't make up our minds before we hear what's actually going on. And I think that maybe there is some room for some specific questions. I get where they're coming from now. We'll get to that. But where do we draw the line on what's going to be discussed in these questions? I seem to think, and a lot of this argument starts going towards the probable cause affidavit, I think you can ask um, people that in the survey, and we'll discuss more why, but how far does that really reach? And when they start to go above and beyond that, I think that's where the judge starts to have a problem as well. That's the public record. That's where the questions came from. There's no violation of the non-dissemination order, if that's what we're going to talk about today. But I think the court should hear from our witness and understand a little bit more about this survey process. I, I'm very interested in that. I told you last time that... I'm Anybody who thinks this is too fast, hit this gear, playback speed, and you can pick whatever one you want. But in order to get you the most information I possibly can in an hour-ish, this is the speed we're going to listen to it on. Focus in, 
And we're going to talk about this because to me, this is really, really interesting stuff. And I want you to hear from them as you get my opinion and breakdown as we go as well. Welcome to all the new members as well. A bunch have already joined in at the beginning of this video. Interesting in what you have to say about this. But, uh, so you're saying that the public record, though, comes out of the case, right? That's public. I'm saying in this case, that's exactly what happened, Judge. I, I don't want to argue the finer points of what's in the media, but I'm saying in this case, that's exactly what happened. That, that affidavit's there, and this court knows we have a ton of things that are filed under seal and more things that are not filed under seal. But that affidavit that began this case has been shared far and wide, and media stories have generated. When you understand how Dr. Edelman does his work to determine if a survey even needs to happen, you'll know where the information came from. Okay, so I... She starts out by saying it's all coming from the probable cause affidavit, but later they admit... There are things that they're talking about in these surveys and in these questions that is not, in fact, in the probable cause affidavit. I'm understanding, okay, the initial probable cause affidavit is part of the public record. And you're saying, well, that got spread, okay, by the media, as you would accept. Um, and that's something that could be concerned. So what I think they, I don't, what Mr. Thompson is talking about, though, is uh, information or questions that were not in and, and so what I'm nervous about that this is I don't want to continue to spread things out that shouldn't be spread. And so I don't know what's in the, in the slides, but if there's information in the slides that isn't that are not in the public record that really have not been um, disseminated generally, then I, mean, I don't really want to spread it. None of us want to spread it more than necessary. Well, last week in court, that was right inside the courtroom. That all became part of the public record. The nine questions were stated repeatedly um, in different formats by Mr. Thompson. That's part of the public record. We've been accused of violating the non-dissemination order. Yeah, but you kind of forced it to be public record, right? Thompson, I don't think would have read it into the record if you guys weren't using it for the survey. Could he have done it under seal or not in the public record? Maybe, but that's how you can't really have your cake and eat it too. So we got to be careful. Um, even defense attorneys got to be careful about what you forced to happen with how you're handling the case. Dr. Edelman's reputation has been impugned by what was stated about him repeatedly. Those questions are fair game, but how And there's a lot of Dr. Edelman's reputation has been impugned. His reputation has taken a hit. He is not happy about it. And he and Thompson are going to exchange words later about how he feels his reputation was impugned by this prosecutor. Having this hearing and allowing our expert to talk about this process that's not the problem. This, the problem with the media happened a long time ago, and it started with the sharing of the affidavit far and wide. I understand that. I, that. I'm pulled in two different directions right now because I'm trying to protect your client at the same time. So if we keep if we keep uh, talking about this, what uh, uh, is not true? Okay, I mean, I guess we can just say, well, it's not true on some of these questions. Maybe that helps to reduce bias. But if uh, if we, One of the judge's suggestions is we tell the people that are being surveyed, well, this isn't true, but have you heard this? I don't like that idea. Don't make that clear. Then it could increase funds. I think. I don't know. Tell me. I mean, well, I'll hear this from the expert. I'm going to say it like this. Mr. Kohlberger is my client, and his rights are of the utmost importance to me. Him being treated fair, his presumption of innocence, him having an impartial jury, those are important things to me, as is his right to counsel. I am not standing up here saying, let me tell you about, about this survey. Let me finish this survey to hurt him. I'm saying there is pervasive media coverage in this case. It's prejudicial media coverage. We conducted a survey in Latah County. That survey is going to show bias and that you shouldn't have a trial in this county. What so that's where we know this is heading, right? No surprise there, but that's where this is heading. And then we get the expert up on the stand and we're going to hear some parts of his testimony. The only thing you need to know about his background, really, because they dig into his background, is he went to Florida State. Harvard of the South, people call it. So we know he's well-educated, um, and I'm only half getting there. Uh, but I mean, this guy is really smart, involved in a lot of these cases, seems like he knows what's going on, um, and absolutely kind of the go-to guy for this kind of stuff. And he references a ton of cases he's worked on. So I do think he's authoritative in this niche area. Um, but let's hear what he has to say. doesn't mean we have to agree with it, but I think I love working in a field like law where there are experts and I can rely on experts and I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room and I know I'm not um, going to nitpick and fight about something that people dedicate their lives to studying, but I'm going to scrutinize it, make sure it makes sense logically, make them explain it to me so I can understand it, right? That's part of it and part of cross-examination. 
because if they're just pulling things out of thin air and they can't explain why or how they got there, then I don't have to believe it. And I can make a pretty good argument that the jury shouldn't believe it either. So I, I love listening to experts and that, that's what a big chunk of the video is going to be today. For example, if there is a prior conviction and then the conviction's thrown out. This is Dr. Edelman, the expert that you hear speaking now. He's not on the screen the whole time because he's also showing a PowerPoint, which I thought it was a very interesting PowerPoint. Definitely a demonstrative aid more fit for jur jurors than a judge with, you know, these background things and stuff. Well, that's pretty prejudicial for the new trial. Not admissible, but very prejudicial. So I'm looking for information like that. I'm looking for um, references to prior records. Uh, maybe there are uh, victim impact statements where people, victims' families may be suggesting what the outcome should be. That could be prejudicial. Um, how did the community respond? Are there candlelight vigils? Are there, um, you know, GoFundMe efforts going on? The status of the victims are focusing on that. So there's a gambit of things that we look at. Um, sometimes there's political elements that are important in high-profile cases because they might be that a politician's involved. So it just depends on the case. So the first thing is assessing the nature of the publicity. Now, if there's not a lot of extensive pre-trial publicity and it's not prejudicial, it stops there. And that's happened. So he, he focuses on what exactly, I'll slow it down a little bit for when he's talking. He talks a little fast. Um, for what, what he's talking about is what they look for specifically. And then what he said at the end there was one of the most important things. If they answer no to some early questions, they don't continue on into the fact-specific questions for this case. And I do think that's important. That's a very important part that I'm not sure was explained to us appropriately. Maybe it went over my head um, in the first uh, hearing. So the fact that they do stop and don't say this to a lot of people that said they have literally no exposure to this case, which is kind of weird because other parts they testify, well, we always got to dig in more and you're surprised what we find when we dig in more. Where there's coverage, but it's very superficial. It's very neutral. There's not a lot of detail. There's nothing particularly um, impactful. Maybe it's focused primarily on just the, the victim or something like that. Um, however, there are other cases where there is extensive pretrial publicity. And then I would recommend case two, which is. Uh, Denise, you know, they absolutely believe, and they say it in this video. I think I'm going to play a clip of it. They believe he is innocent. So, I mean, that's lawyers represent people that are guilty of things, obviously. But I mean, in this case, they absolutely have publicly put on the stance that they believe he's innocent. Um, and he absolutely is innocent right now, presumed innocent until he's proven guilty. It's a community attitude, sir. Because just because there's prejudicial coverage does not mean it had an impact on the jury pool. And that is the question that matters most. What impact has the prejudicial media coverage had on the jury pool? I don't really care if it's correct information, it came from social media, it came from the news. It had an impact on the jury pool. That's what matters because they develop. A he doesn't care. If it's true, correct, or accurate, he doesn't care if it came from social media. He doesn't care where it came from. That's interesting to me for reasons why you will discuss as the video goes on. But that's what he said right there in his own words. Opinions and attitudes. It doesn't make a difference if that fact's true or false. They still develop an opinion and an attitude about the defendant, about the evidence, and perceptions of guilt. All of that is what I'm looking at. So I want to see if... The media coverage has had an impact, and that's how, why we do a community attitude survey. Um, and then depending on the results of the survey, we either, there's not enough evidence there to suggest that anything is required. It could be remedial measures such as individual sequestered blood deer. Maybe that's appropriate in some cases. All the way to so Then he says, based on what they find, they make a suggestion as to what they think should happen as far as change of venue or some kind of remedial measure. Uh, Real T. And they said it was their honor to represent him. Yes, they emphasized that it was their honor to represent Brian Coburger. Um... Let me see here. All right. And he, he also talks about how he focuses on local media. He doesn't really care what they're reporting in Dallas. But when we talk about social media being local, there are some holes I could definitely pick in his testimony. But generally speaking, I get um, what he's thinking. John, great point. Is he really presumed, though? And that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of with this expert. By the way, I am absolutely going to use chunks of this when I talk about, because, you know, sometimes I'm in these situations where I talk to some groups about cameras in the courtroom and true crime being on TV and on YouTube and all out there. And how is it going to affect our profession as lawyers? How's it going to affect our cases? I thought this testimony from this expert was really great in helping us out with that. Yes. Wait. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. How did you become aware of it? Well, the first time I became aware of it was when I was reading newspaper coverage because that was one of the topics of media coverage, was discussing the non-dissemination order and media's efforts to have it changed. So I was able to read it and follow it in that media coverage. So that's the first time I saw it. And in January, 
did you receive an email from my office with the non-dissemination order? I believe I did. And you- He already knew about the non-dissemination order because it was talked about publicly, obviously, on channels like this, where we broke it down, and also her office sent it to him. So he did know about the non-dissemination order. It had no effect on what he decided to put in here as his questions, which again, I don't necessarily think that's as strong as the as of an argument as the state does. Looked at a hard copy again recently. Yes. All right. Does that non-dissemination order change how you did your work? Sorry, you Does the existence of the non-dissemination order change how you did your work? No, it did not. Have you worked in cases where there's a non-dissemination order at other times? Many times. Was the sole source of the information that you use contained in the media? Was it contained on the media? Yes. yes. Everything I used was widely disseminated through the media. Widely disseminated. Did you find out where the media got the information? Yes. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Bill Thompson. So where did the media get their information? Where did they get it from? How did this happen? How is this possible? Well, it's never usually a good thing in a situation like this when you see your face come up on the screen and you're sitting there as the lawyer. But that's what happened to Bill Thompson here. They are using his press conference to talk about how did all this start? How did the media get their hands on this? And how did it get twisted and sent out there in all sorts of different ways that are prejudicial to Brian Koberger? Well, here's the state or here's the defense's position on that. I'm the talk to any prosecutor. And it's sad to be here, but happy to be here at the same time. I can't be a Well, I'm going to do my best to turn this off. Yeah, I, in my office and the investigators have to live with the restrictions that our Supreme Court places on pretrial publicity. That said, I promise you we will share with you through the court process or otherwise whatever we are allowed to. I just appreciate your patience on that. The uh, factual basis for the charges are summarized in what's called a probable cause affidavit that is on file with the court. According to the rules of the Idaho Supreme Court, that is sealed until Mr. Kohlberger is physically back in Latah County and has been served with the Idaho arrest warrant. At that time, we expect that that affidavit will be available to you so you can share the true facts with all of your readers and your watchers and your listeners uh, and all the people who are interested and really need to know what's going on. So we've had patience. We're going to get the probable cause affidavit. You're going to get it so you can share the truths and facts with your readers. And they're going to use that against them. Now, what's interesting about this is there's been a lot of fighting in our nation about transparency and how important it is. And transparency with these public documents is something that we want. So to now kind of twist it and use it against them is interesting, especially when everybody has seemingly been on the same page about sealing things and not wanting cameras and trying to limit the pretrial publicity. But they're going to blame him for people taking the probable cause affidavit reporting on it and adding to it with that reporting. What do you guys think about that? She's with us on that. Uh, we hope to get that to you as soon as we can. In that clip, you heard reference to the probable cause affidavit. Yes. And did you hear reference to sharing it with all your readers and watchers? viewers, watchers, and listeners, and anyone else who's interested. Did your research tell you that the media took Mr. Thompson up on that offer to share this far and wide? Yes. Good afternoon, folks. What did you say? Basically, the media took that document and then published the highlights and key findings in that document and added editorial commentary to that information. So let's be clear, they didn't just read the affidavit, there's editorial, there's debate, there's discussion, there's spin, all of it in news stories. And these stories. I agree with him. That did happen. Now, did Bill Thompson tell them to do that? No. Should he have known they were going to do that? Maybe. But they're basically trying to say they had to do all this because of Bill Thompson's actions, which I think is was an interesting shot taken. Lane said, there are definitely hurt feelings on all sides. Is it normal for a prosecution to encourage reading legal files from a press conference? So, to be fair to Bill Thompson, there was a lot of requests and pushing and even from the victims' families about transparency and knowing what's going on and making this stuff public and the public and the uh, citizens have a right to this information. 
And so he was saying, whoa, 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 listen, listen, I'm going to share. You're going to be able to see the probable cause affidavit and you're going to be able to share that with all your people that are interested in this case. So that was kind of the context and how all that was developing at the time because we were covering it way back then. I remember when this first happened before there was even an arrest, we started covering it because the victims hired lawyers and you guys had questions about why do crime victims hire lawyers? And that's kind of how we originally got into covering this case. For example, this one has over 200, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see it. Do you have a copy of the... <clears throat> I do. Um, Your Honor, I have surprised they couldn't find a video with, you know, more views and comments, but it says 130,000 views on YouTube, 244 comments. Actually, I'm going to correct myself. The reason they did this is because he focuses on local media. So I think this is a local media station. That's why. A printed copy of his PowerPoint. If on YouTube alone. So example, this one is on a local television station. On YouTube alone. 130,000 views and 224 comments. So people discussing it. That's just one example of how this document was disseminated through the media in this county, just as Mr. Thompson suggested during his press conference. And did you check another media source and see that it continued to be shared? Yes, this is a second example. Um, and you can see just from the heading, it says court records unsealed. And then they go through a timeline, including information from that affidavit, um, highlighting all the key findings about the car and other things that are widely reported and disseminated from that document to lay to cap saturating the community with prejudicial details from that document, which was reported in the press conference to be truthful as well. Um, 54,000 views, 176 comments on just one other video of a, a news clip on YouTube. And based on your research, did the story or stories continue to be shared far and wide? Yes. If Janelle Finch is joining Cases you know that. massive media coverage saturating this county with prejudicial pretrial rules. How about the social media? It was also spread through social media, and people have talked about it on social media. And do you know if misinformation and rumors ended up uh, as a result of this information shared right from the start? It's kind of a weird PowerPoint for a judge. Again, I'm sorry, I keep that keeps hitting me, but we all agree with this, and we know this is true, and we know this is happening. Yes, and the reason I looked at this and knew it was because in the media coverage, they discussed the spreading of rumors on social media. For example, a professor who was accused by a psychic of being responsible for this. Um, we know about that case and how it had its whole, whole own life on social media um, and defamation and everything that followed. Um, he talks about how the media he reviewed made him think that the survey was necessary. And this survey has been used since the seventies and hundreds of cases. Um, people who follow the news usually know more details. His methodology is tried and true. He's even used it a hundred times or hundreds of times. So this is not something new. This is not something that's never been tested or used in other cases. It has absolutely been used in other cases by him and other experts. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit about the methodology and the standards and way that he does this. Why are there standards? Why does that matter? I'm sorry, why are there standards? Yes. Well, one is you want to make sure, I mean, there, as we learn more about research and, and human behavior, we learn more about what you should and shouldn't do. So, for example, um, there's something called social desirability. Um, people want to create a positive impression of themselves. So when you ask questions, for example, can you be a fair juror? Well, we all want to be fair people. So you're more likely to get a socially desirable response. The initial step on Everybody's going to want to say yes to that. And I know this when I'm picking juries, nobody admits off the jump. Yeah, I can't be fair and unbiased until you dig into the facts of the case. But everybody wants to think they can be open-minded. They can make a good decision. They can put anything in their past to the side. It's not going to bother them. They're able to do this. But when you start saying, you know, this happened to your mom, are you sure you're not going to be thinking about that? You know, when you're on this case or things like that, then sometimes their answer will change. And I give people credit. Once they, once you really can get them to dig in and buy in, which again, on this channel, took some time for us, right? Probably took a couple of videos. You weren't just like, yeah, trust this guy. I think we can talk about this stuff, whatever it may be. But now you guys are pretty open. We share thoughts and questions and how we look at this stuff and why we look at this stuff this way, knowing that we don't always have to agree. We will always try to be respectful, but it's hard to get people to kind of break down the initial barrier and really tell you how they feel respectfully but tell you how you feel. Don't just agree with somebody. Don't just say, yeah, I can do this. I can put all this aside. I can put my firmly held beliefs aside because people usually can't. That was all the way back into voting. Um, in California, there was an election for governor. I think it's Davis or something like that. Uh, 
And all the polling suggested he was going to win. He was African American, and um, he lost. And that was when they started looking at that, and they saw all these different impacts in terms of like race of the interviewer. All these things affect how people respond. People overestimate that they vote because you can look at voting records and it's inflated. People overestimate they have a library card and a million other things. So those are things like we look at when we craft the survey. We don't want to have social questions that lead to social desirable responses, order effects, a host of objects. In your survey, it looks like you have sections designed in your survey. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you can you hear me? Okay. Better with the microphone. Okay, I'll try to stand closer over here. I want to I want to understand this section, the, these sections. Okay. Why do you have sections in this survey? Sections? Yes. Well, one is you don't want things to be jumping back and forth all over the place because um, it's harder to take a survey like that. You'll have more people drop off, confusion potential order effects. So we try to organize the survey in the section. Pay attention to how the sections go, because he's going to talk about how they don't get to the next section. If they're not eligible to be on the jury, then they don't get to section two and so forth. And so all the key questions on one topic are together and the next section changes topics. So it's easy to follow. What is the purpose of section three, case awareness and prejudgment? Why is that in there? So that's the meat of the survey. That's the most important section. Um, so case awareness measures initially case recognition. We craft a recognition question based off of the media coverage. What are the things widely reported that are not overly prejudicial because you don't want to create an order that would stimulate a memory of, yes, I remember that case. So if widely reported A, B, and C facts that every you, know, you read the coverage and you see this was mentioned 100 times, that's a widely reported fact. So we create case recognition question. Now, if somebody says, yes, I remember that case, I have read or heard about it, they are asked a prejudgment question next, guilt or innocence this question. Um, then there are open-ended questions and then those case-specific items. Now, let's say someone does not remember the, the case based on their back, the case recognition question. We give them one more fact to see if it'll stimulate a memory. Something neutral that might stimulate a memory. You usually get one to two percent more that we call the case for them. If that so it's like if they don't know anything, you throw a little little breadcrumb out there if they pick it up and now that jogs their memory. It's kind of like our cases sometimes if it's you know, case that I'm handling and Pete walks in and I'm like, hey, I'm talking about this Smith case. And he's like, What is that case? And I'm like, Oh, it's the one with the, you know, pickup truck carrying two trailers behind it. He's like, oh yeah, okay, I remember that case. You know, it's a fact that jogs their memory. So that's what they try to do to get people to continue talking about this case. John said, criminal justice attitudes, is that what it says? Yes, yeah, so it's usually like, what do you think about our criminal justice system? Do you think it's fair? You know, what do you think about the level playing field, presumption of innocence, maybe those kinds of questions usually is what that means. Colfax said they perform the surveys pretty much every high profile case. No, I don't not, not on every high profile case. It's got to reach, reach an echelon of having a lot of media attention, um, dealing with prejudicial media attention. So I don't know if I'd say every high profile case, but plenty of them, plenty of them. Um, the experts method methodology is sound. I have a background in stats and program in RR studio every day. Uh, Maggie says, didn't the defense try to pull one on the judge and prosecutor with the survey? Isn't that the problem? And the last two questions. No, everybody knew there was going to be a survey and the judge and the prosecutor both have said already, their problem is not that there is a survey, but with some questions, like you're saying here, maybe just the last two questions is where their problem is. That person recognizes the case from there. They are also asked that prejudgment question to be considered. If they do not recognize the case, they skip the rest of the survey and they're asked demographic questions about media consumption habits and demographics. So if they don't know anything about the case, even after get it, try and get their memory jog, they don't hear those specific questions. Now, what is the question that they use to be the thing that jogs their memory in the breadcrumb? What is that? I'd like to know that because that sounds like a case specific question. But then if they still don't know it after that, they don't continue on, which I think is a good thing. The next step of the survey after the prejudgment question is uh, an open ended question. What have you read, seen or heard about the case? There might be a few others we had based off of these things we might find in the media coverage. And then they continue on to those case specific items that we've been talking about. Have you read, seen, or heard if so and so? I want to make sure I understand this and that this is clear for everybody. Those nine questions that have been the problem last week and this week, if you have somebody who says, no, I don't know that case, do you ask them those nine questions? No, they skip to the demographic questions. What tell me what are the demographic questions, just to be sure? If somebody doesn't recognize the case, they immediately go to questions, for example, how often do you read the newspaper? Every day, several times a week, uh, rarely, never, something like that. Then they're asked how often they follow the local news, and then they'll ask a few demographic questions like age, gender, race, ethnicity. So if somebody doesn't remember the case, 
you don't infuse information or do any of the things that were brought out last week. No. I wonder if somebody says, yeah, I consume media all the time. I read all the newspapers, watch everything on local news. If they then don't go back and say, well, are you sure you haven't seen anything about this case? Because I kind of feel like they would. Because he even talked about before, people who consume more media are obviously more likely to know about the case. I have on the screen in front of me some of the red seen or heard questions. Yes. What are these? You don't have to read them all. Just tell me what they are. These are nine items, which we always use. They've been presented out there for everybody to see to see, and Bill Thompson read them the other day. Have you read, seen, or heard F? And these are items taken from the media coverage that were widely reported. And let me be clear, widely reported, hundreds and thousands of times, um, and potentially prejudicial items. Because neutral, run-of-the-mill media coverage is often not grounds for a change of that. So if somebody knew there were four victims, that's not particularly prejudicial, is it? That's a pretty benign fact. But if somebody knows, for example, um, about a prior conviction that's not admissible, that's very prejudicial. And it might be he talks about prior convictions and stuff like that to use a fact not in this case so that he's not pushing out the stuff in this case even more. So I appreciate that. And that's if you hear him say stuff like that, he's trying to use stuff that don't actually apply to this case. He correlated with prejudgment. And I would like to know that because if it's widely prejudicial and everybody knows about it, and it's correlated with prejudgment, that may that would likely have an impact on my recommendations because that's the type of pre-child publicity that has been recognized by the Supreme Court, I'm sure the state court here that is most concerning. So these kinds of questions, these case-specific questions, you do this in all the surveys that you do. Yes. And um, in this case, these nine questions came straight out of the media. Absolutely. And again, widely reported throughout the media, thousands of times. All right. Um, he talks about, again, more examples from other cases that he's done this on and how he does it with prosecutors too, not just defense attorneys. Um, we're going to jump ahead just a little bit here. Uh, and talk about why he thinks he absolutely should not and could not and would not even continue on this case if they make him remove these specific questions. The open-ended question, do people report it? Because if they don't and they do know it, well, that's very concerning, and that's the type of problem we run into in voir dire. Sounds like that's one of the reasons you have case-specific questions in there. That's one of the reasons, absolutely. You heard last week and then you've heard it again today about can't you just change this survey and take those case specific questions out and then do the survey can you do that i would not do that no can you explain why not because this is based off of 15 years of doing this i know for certain and there's research on it as well that when you ask people an open-ended question what have you read seen or heard about the case they have a difficult time recalling everything from memory that's a recall question the cognitive effort required to recall everything from memory that you know is very challenging He's right. If you just ask this vague kind of question, there's going to be a small percentage of people that actually know about the case that will recall, remember, or be able to really dig into it. So I am more on board with asking some case specific questions after listening to him and more as we continue to listen. This is recognition, which is a much lower cognitive look. Have you read, seen, or heard if? Oh, now I can search my memory. Yes, I know that fact. If I asked you, tell me everything you know about the movie Star Wars. You would tell me a whole bunch of interesting things about Chewbacca and Ewoks and maybe a bunch of other stuff. But I am very confident that you would miss things. You would not tell me every single detail from memory you know about that movie. And then I would ask you something like, did you know that Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's father? And you'd probably say, yeah, of course, I knew that. But you didn't mention it in the recall question. Um, there's a mountain of research on this. Usually what they do is they have people read uh, like a paragraph or a story and they ask them, write down everything you recall from what you just read. And then they do a different type of quiz did you read? This is really real. And we've had clients with traumatic brain injuries that have had to do things like this and test their recall. And this is how they test it. And, and it's, you can see it's very different with people, obviously with traumatic brain injuries than people that don't, but this is exactly how they use testing like this to see what you can remember and how you can jog someone's memory and what they just automatically forget or don't mention after just reading it. And they obviously know it and have heard it, but it's not going to be something on the tip of their tongue. That the truck was red. Did you read that there was an ambulance? Oh, yeah, of course. And they check that too. And what it shows is recognition rates, the ability to recall information when asked a closed ended question, is much higher than when you ask an open ended question. So, getting back to your comment or question, if I only ask, what do you read know about this case? I know for a fact you'll get things like, well, I remember when it happened. There were four victims. There was a knife. Um, I remember there's a delay. Um, I just saw it in the media. Those are the things that people say. They've said it in this survey. They've said it in the hundred surveys I've done prior. They've said it in Vladir when I look at transcripts. That's what you see. 
So it's cool that he looks at what your transcripts later on. He talks about how he actually uses some questions in some of his surveys that not just what lawyers ask in voir dire, but some of the things judges ask, because he learns a lot when he reads real voir dire. And those are obviously appropriate questions and things to ask people. But when you ask those closed ended questions, you discover that they know quite a bit more. And that's what I'm trying to look at. I need to know what do people actually know? And is there information, prejudicial details that they don't mention that they do know when you ask the open ended question? And those those details, the closed questions, the have you read, seen, or heard questions, are they important to determine if there's bias, that um, media coverage has created a prejudicial effect and that there's bias? Absolutely. If 80% of people are able to recognize a prejudicial detail, um, and I keep making up because I don't want to upset anyone here, like a prior conviction, if 80% know that detail, but only 3% mention it in the question, what have you read, seen, or heard about the case, that's a major problem. I need to know that because it's an extremely prejudicial fact being spread on social media. Whether they're true or not, they still impact the jury. Very prejudicial. I need to know if they know that. And I know for a fact in this case that, for example, I'm not going to mention the detail, but for one of them, only 3%, 3% of people in the survey mentioned the detail when asked, what have you read, seen, or heard about this case? It was something spread on social media. But when you ask, have you read, seen, or heard of X, Y, and Z, 45% knew that fact. And that's so 3% mentioned it with the open-ended question, 45% when you ask about the specific fact that they did know it. And that's a big deal. And that's a big difference. And again, I think it's important to find out who knows what to a certain extent. But I do agree with him that this is right. This is logical. This makes sense. This matches up with other experts I've heard talk about similar situations. So I do appreciate this testimony. And you know, I'm learning a lot. I hope Judge Judge is as well. Um, then they get into the guilt questions, which we'll jump to here. Um, first I'm going to answer some questions. Laura, slow. When I slow down the video, you sounded like me. You're on drugs. I'm not promise. I'm not, I can talk faster. Uh, Nikki. Hey, Peter, two L down here in law school in Florida. Oh, where, uh, you just want to say these videos have helped me understand the intricacies of the law planning on practicing in the Clearwater area. That's awesome. It's beautiful here. I love it. Uh, Mama Wolf, why do they try to move venues before starting the jury questionnaires are done? There are people who can be impartial and people who do not follow the news or social media. So the judge asks about that actually. Like, what about people that don't pick up the phone, right? Or just don't watch news or social media at all? Does that mean they, we can't have a jury of them? And it's like, you can't just have a jury of them. You want to have a nice represent representation of the community, but... In these high profile cases, sometimes you know before a jury even shows up that a too big of a chunk of the jury pool is biased. So you, it's so likely that you end up with a biased jury that we just can't do the, the uh, trial here. And it's the exception, not the rule. We don't change venue like that. It's a very limited number of cases. Um, Amy, this guy is completely legit because they are addressing all the misinformation by media. If you have a jury that heard those things, it's an issue. So we're going to wait till we get to misinformation for where he gets there because there's a little bit I'm a little shakier on than he is. Nora, love catching your lives, Peter. I think Ann Taylor is articulate and firm. I like that about her. This trial is going to be interesting. No doubt about that. Joe Mendoza, is there a legal definition of public record? There seems to be a disconnect between the court and defense about what this means. The court thinks public records are records from officials, but I think defense interprets it as public media. So what I'll say is the normal legal definition of public record is things that are officially public, like certain um, property records are public. Uh, court documents in certain jurisdictions are public. What certain government officials make as a salary is public. Those are usually what's considered the public record. Now, media and things that are publicly available are usually not considered public records. Usually public records are considered more reliable. There are public, I'm sorry, public records exceptions in the law. I can put things in as evidence as if they are public record. And I can prove they're public record because we show how they get on the official website and blah, blah, blah. I can't just pull a news article or a social media post and get it in through the public records exception. I'm going to look up the, the language for the public records exception and, and we'll... I'll see if I can read that to you. Maybe that'll give us some insight, but let's listen to him explain uh, more about what he does here. Coverage or bias for guilt with the amount of specific details recognized. 
Yes, because I asked those case-specific questions. If I didn't, I would not be able to. Because as you saw, people say things like, haven't seen anything lately. Well, that doesn't really do much for me. I can't analyze that. I can't do anything for that. I don't ask those case-specific items. I can't test the validity of the survey. I can't test to see how case-specific knowledge impacts prejudgment. I can't test to see if there's one particular item that's highly prejudicial that we should be worried about, that should, you know, that's inadmissible. What percentage knows that detail? Um, all those things are required to do is correct. And how do you know that there's... All right, before we get to her answer, let me read you this. Uh, public record exception to hearsay. A record or statement of a public office if it sets out the office's activities, a matter observed while under a legal duty to report, but not including in a criminal case, a matter observed by law enforcement personnel or in a civil case or against the government in a criminal case, factual findings from a legally authorized investigation and the opponent does not show that the source of the information or other circumstances indicate a lack of trustworthiness. And that's, I think, what we're getting to when we talk about public record. They are inherently trustworthy. No jokes about trusting uh, the government and the public. But but that, Joe, hopefully answers your question. That's That was an interesting, interesting question. And just randomly that popped into my head, the public records exception. Um, so that's kind of closest thing we can probably get to it. Prejudgment in a case. What questions do you ask, and when do you ask them to know that there's prejudgment or bias in a case? Well, after the case recognition question, they're asked based off of what you've read, seen, or heard about this case. You believe the defendant's guilty of whatever the crime is, and it's on scale, like definitely guilty to definitely not guilty. Um, so that's a prejudgment question. I have a second follow-up question, which was actually developed from a judge that I thought was really effective, and the question was. Um, would a defendant have a difficult time convincing you that he's not guilty? So it's a presumption of guilt as opposed to a presumption of innocence. And he got that from a judge from another case who asked it in voir dire. And obviously, if you know that the defendant's going to have a tough time convincing you they're innocent, this juror is biased. They don't get the presumption of innocence and the burden of proof. This was in Tennessee. It was a high profile case. And similarly, people would report a lot of detail and then they'd say, I think he's guilty. And then they ask, well, can you be fair and impartial? And go, yeah, I think I could be fair. I can try. I think I can do it. And, then and that's absolutely a fact, too. They're like, yeah, he's probably guilty, but I could be fair and impartial. It's like, well, I'll just specifically speak for Florida because that's what I know mostly about, you know, in voir dire and striking jurors for cause. You can't rehabilitate that. Even though they say, yeah, I think he's guilty, but I can be fair and impartial because sometimes we can rehabilitate and say, well, even knowing that or notwithstanding that, could you still be fair and impartial? Only certain things can you rehabilitate, and that wouldn't be one of them. Court would ask, well, would the defendant have a difficult time convincing you that he's not guilty? And they say, oh yeah, definitely. He could be hard to change my mind. So I use that question because I thought it was really effective and it happens to correlate much better than the set-aside question with prejudgment um, and a host of other things. So do you ask those questions before you say, have you read, seen, or heard these particular Absolutely. Things? If you didn't, you'd be creating order. So you have to do that. Will you say if you didn't, you'd be creating problems. Say that again, you'd be creating what? Order effects. Um, if, if I put in, a, in like a recognition question. Creating order, sorry. Did he say order? Order effects. Sorry, I thought he said problems. Some detail that's extraordinarily prejudicial. I'll go back to my prior conviction thing for the same crime. And then you say, oh, do you think he's guilty? Well, you just told me he had a jury convicted. Of course I think he's guilty. So you, 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 if you included all those nine items and then you ask somebody, do you think he's guilty? You just gave them all this information that's prejudicial. So yes, that would be an order. So you would never do that. So you ask. That's why he's saying, and, and so he just made a little admission there. I'm going to back it up. So he said, you ask them if they think he's guilty and all those questions first, because once you give them all that information, then of course it's so prejudicial. Of course they're going to think he's guilty. And therein lies the problem. That's what Judge Judge is trying to balance here. We don't want to tell all these people these things, because if you're saying it's automatically prejudicial, which I tend to agree, I don't know that the state would agree that everything in the public record is automatically prejudicial, but I agree with this expert. And we've kind of been saying that from the jump that He's being convicted in the court of public opinion. But if you know that telling people all these things would then make them think he's guilty, then you would agree all these people should be struck for cause as well and couldn't be on the jury because you've told them these nine things. So you, 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 if you included all those nine items and then you asked somebody, do you think he's guilty? You just gave them all this information that's prejudicial. So yes. That would be an order. So you would never do that. So you ask them well ahead of case specific well, questions. They have to recognize the case. They have to agree. I know of this case. And then you ask if they already have an idea of what they think of whether Mr. Coburn is guilty or not in our case. Correct. And then you have the case recognition and you can measure the bias or the prejudicial effect of the media with the incidents of those 
questions. What right. I look at is the prejudgment question, right? That's on a scale, so Likert scale. Um, and then I can look at things like, is a relationship between the number of details somebody knows and the strength of opinion? Definitely guilty, for example, if you know a lot of detail. I can look at case-specific items, uh, media items. Um, if you knew about X, is that correlated with prejudgment or bias? Is there something that, you know, and so on and on. So that's how we look at the relationship between prejudgment um, and these different factors. Were you able to determine if case knowledge was impacting bias in Brian Coverter's case? Yes. So because we asked these questions, what we found is that um, one, like, like I said, very high recognition rate. So 79% of respondents knew at least five years. We've been looking at these percentages the whole time. So yes, obviously issues, people thinking that he's guilty. Um, and then we start talking a little bit about misinformation and we get into how important dealing with misinformation is. Stuff in the media came out in trial. The idea that I can cognitively say, okay, I know this prejudicial detail and I'm going to put it in a box in my mind and never think about it and process everything. Um, and it's never gonna affect me. It's just, there's nothing to support that. It's kind of in our everyday lives. That's what brains work. Like think about what's going on today with Trump and Biden and all that. Everybody has strong opinions. The idea that, oh yeah, well, it's not legitimate or that fact is wrong, it's misinformation. So it won't affect me. There's nothing to support that. There's even research that shows you, you have people, you, they read a passage, then they write it something supporting a, a, a position that was in the passage. And then you tell them that information is not true. It's called belief perseverance or belief persistence. And what they find is even when you tell them that fact is not true, they still have a difficult time not believing it. And it still impacts their views. They still defend it, even then. I, I'm not going to mention any misinformation or anything, but is that your guys' experience in life? Because it's certainly mine. He mentioned Trump and Biden. It's like people can know something is wrong or you can tell them something is wrong. And it's not necessarily going to always change the way they look at it. Because some people don't ever back down or change their opinion on something. So I do agree with that. But that's one of the reasons I think we need to make sure we're not spreading information, even with these surveys. Because once you do that, it's kind of over. Well, that's certainly my experience. So there's a host of research on this. The idea that we should only test things that are factually accurate and assume that the other stuff isn't prejudicial is just ridiculous. So a massive amount of prejudicial media coverage is a factor that has to be considered in a case with this kind of coverage. Is that right? Yes. I, I want to know, though, from your experience, have you done a survey like this, like taking these nine case-specific questions where a judge decided to change venue? Yes. Yeah, just wanted to get that last part in there. So this has obviously happened in other cases. He's used it in other cases, and um, he has gotten venue changed. Uh, Candace said, why can't we just skip the surveys, cost so much money? Why can't they try to find a jury within the county, and if they can't find 12 people, move on to another county? So this happens in a lot of cases, um, but you don't want to waste people's time, right? And it can waste resources if you do that. Then you can't. Then you have to do more stuff. And so, you know, balancing the time and money uh, it's up to the defense, obviously, if they want to pay to have a surveyor do this, um, it's up to them and they're allowed to do it. So they decided to do it in this case. Uh, he also talks about how he would not let lawyers tell him what questions to ask or use. He doesn't care what lawyers say, or maybe even the judge. He knows what to ask and he has to do it on his methodology or it's not going to work appropriately. It's always interesting when stuff like that comes out. Then... Um, he starts talking about what we do if there's bias everywhere, not just in this county, which is also a big question in this case. It's the state. It's a national case. And depending on what the results are of the survey, I'm assuming if we find that there's grounds for a change of venue here, that's the recommendation, the response will be, well, there's nowhere else to move it. Everybody's been cut saturated with pre child publicity, so there's no need to change it. The point of the comparison survey is to address that question. Is there anywhere in the state where you could move it? Maybe there's not. I don't know. Um, but that's the only way to find out. And you have to conduct the survey in the same manner. I don't know if I just ask people what they know about the case and you get general, I just recall when it happened, we have the same guilt rate. Do they know inadmissible details? Do they know about things from that affidavit? Do they have a lot of case specific knowledge or is it just a general awareness of the case? Do they drive by the house where the crime occurred? All these things, all these things that make this county unique that you want to test for in other communities. So it's not just a question of general awareness. I need to know what case specific information they have, what misinformation they have, what media items they've been exposed to. Do they have as much uh, case detail and knowledge as they do here? All of those things. So that's why I would suggest it's important. Um, without that, the only thing I can do would be to collect the media coverage and assess, for example, like, are there fewer articles published in Bonneville County 
or Ada County compared to here. That's all we have. You know, I wouldn't conduct a survey that I know is going to be to misleading information. I'm not going to do that. To change the survey, would that go against the methodology that you use? Yes. If I, if I change the survey and I don't conclude those items, I can't test. Well, do people know a lot of case specific information that was widely reported? Are those specific items related to bias? Um, with What's interesting is he basically gives a very hard stance that no. The answer is no. Uh, he will only continue on this case if he can do it the way he knows is right, regardless of what the court or lawyers say. And if they force him to change, he's not interested. He backs off that a little bit later. So we'll wait till we get between him and the, the judge. But the next thing we're going to jump to is the state he gets to cross-examine him. And this is where it starts to get a little spicy between Mr. Thompson, the witness, um, and Taylor. So buckle up. Johnson, thank you, Mark. Um, I mean, we'll start going backwards here, or from the back of the, the front of it. Um, I'm sorry if your feelings get hurt about us raising this issue. I see you were almost breaking down a few minutes ago when you were talking about slide number 33. Basically saying he was almost like crying when they were talking about it breaking down um, because he was so hurt about how they were talking about his expertise. Three, uh, oh, slide number 31. That's not the intent. And it's certainly, I was, I'm surprised to see that reaction from an experienced expert such as yourself. So I don't it's almost like a backhanded apology. Like, I'm sorry you feel that way. I was also a little surprised that an experienced expert would respond that way. I apologize for that. I, I accept your apology. But the idea of after working really hard 15 years to develop a credible reputation and being told, uh, watching on Zoom, that I am tainting the jury pool and poisoning the jury pool and contaminating the jury pool by doing what's required and standard, I'm not crying. I'm angry. Okay. Yes, it doesn't. And please. And yes, it does offend me. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if I was him if the prosecutor said that. Because I think there is an argument that you're tainting, maybe not poisoning, tainting a small percentage of the potential jury pool. Like, I think that's a viable comment to make. Go ahead and be as angry as you like as you continue from your work for the defense in this case. Um, it is a fact, though. Go ahead and be as angry as you like, he says. That you don't know of the, what, 400 citizens that were questioned on this survey. You don't know which ones of them did not already previously know any of the fact-specific representations in your questions. Isn't that true? I do know because they answered yes or no to the question. No. He's wrong. Bill Thompson's right here. Okay. And, and, and it's frustrating because he's like, you don't know if they knew about a fact until you ask him about that fact. He's like, well, we ask him first. We know you ask him the exact question you said doesn't really work, which is the open-ended question where it's like, what well, do you know about this case? Yeah. But then you don't actually know if what they know about this case is this specific fact until you ask about the specific fact. Do you watch this channel? Oh, yeah. I think I've seen it. Do you know Peter has long hair? You don't know if somebody knew I had long hair until they tell you. Okay. Before you asked the question, you didn't know that. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And so somebody who hadn't heard the representation in that one slide that you acknowledged was false. Uh, let's see. Do you know that be false? Which one? The, the, um, the All right. So here's something I wanted to uh, bring up because Addy Martinez asked it early on. Rebecca, by the way, welcome. We haven't seen you in a little while. Thanks for gifting 10 memberships. Uh, you've been on Rewatch Crew. I think everybody in the previous case was feeling 10 feet tall and bulletproof due to alcohol. Adult should have walked away. That's on the Mew case. Thank you, Rebecca. Addy asked, uh, Bill Thompson said, what was not true about Brian Koberger stalking the victims? He completely lost it. I think that was very interesting too. That we now have confirmation from Bill Thompson that Brian Koberger did not, in fact, stalk these victims. But let's hear how the question played out. You acknowledge it's false that uh, Mr. Koberger allegedly stalked one of the victims. That's false. You know that to be false. Which one? Did Mr. Koberger allegedly stalk one of the victims? Yes, I was trying not to say that. Because but but, you, but you, knew, you knew that was false. I did. Yes. And so you have now, for anybody who had never heard that before, that question is now planted into them unqualified representation that Mr. Koberger stalked one of the witnesses. And that's false. That's false. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's a good argument from Bill Thompson. I know some people like him. Some people don't like him. 
I thought that was a good question and a really good point that he was making. Uh, JLL said, but don't you still think like you did before they can ask pointed questions, but without the exact details and serve the same purpose. So I'm going to reserve my answer to this. Cause I'm going to give you my opinion at the end. So yes, yes, but yes, but plus got a little, a little extra I'm going to put in there. Gringa, why can't they just ask neutral questions? Like how many things, if any, do you know about this case? Cause he's saying that they won't tell you the details they know based on those questions and based on his research on how that's done. Okay. All right. Um, you testified. I want to make sure that you heard this correctly. That inadmissible or false information is can be the most prejudicial information. It can be, yes. And your surveyors put that false information into the minds of people who were asked that question who may not have previously heard it. Correct. Correct. Relative Thank to you. media. Thank you. It's mentioned it hundreds and thousands of times. As if that's an excuse to where he should be able to tell it to people because the media mentioned it hundreds of thousands of times. And, and just, just make sure we're clear too. Um, around the same time in your testimony, um, I believe you testified that you don't care if the information that you put in your specific questions to uh, the people being surveyed is correct. That you said that, didn't you? Right. I don't know what you mean by correct. True or false? I care about whether or not it's proliferated by the media. You don't care if it's true. No, I don't. I know everybody's a prejudice. So it's okay. It's getting a little a little heated here. And Bill Thompson, I mean, he does have the goods on some of these questions. It's in his PowerPoint. He already testified to it. We watched it together. He's like, and the judge is not gonna like, I'll just tell you, judges hate to hear that. Okay. It is so hard for a judge to hear somebody on the witness stand saying, Yeah, what I use to get my data and do this, I don't care if it's true or not. I don't care if I'm telling prospective jurors true things or not. And while it may be proper, and, and we're going to talk about the lawyer's argument at the end, it's really hard for a judge to just be like, yeah, we don't care if we're telling them things that we know are false. To taint people who had never heard that information before for the end result of identifying others who have and might have bias. Is yeah, that, is that gonna, your statement? I'm going to object no, to the questions. He's, he he's the question. badgering. Wait, wait, wait. Let me finish uh, my objection. Yeah, it's an objection. He's badgering the witness. He's misstating his testimony, and I object. Well, this says by you didn't care if the information was correct, Judge. Um, yeah, overall. So, may I so just, yeah, just. No, that's okay. One person can talk at a time. And, you know, let's take down the tone a little bit. Yes, sir. People who were, just so we're clear, the questions, fact specific questions were propounded to people who were taking the survey. Um, did not, after asking the question even, uh, qualify the false facts as saying this may or may not be true, or this is actually a false fact. You didn't, the survey didn't tell them that what they might have heard was false. First of all, I don't call them facts because they're media items. And second of all, that would be ridiculous. And no, I wouldn't do that in a survey. Are you suggesting I follow up? Have you read, seen, or heard if he stalked and oh, by the way, if you know that, let me tell you, it's not true. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm suggesting because isn't that exactly what happens in the voir dire process? No. Do you see Bill Thompson doing this? By the way, my dad does that sometimes and it makes me so mad. But he's like, isn't it true that a little point sometimes and some judges, um, uh, you know, have a problem with it. Others don't. Usually people do not tell my dad what to do in the courtroom. Sometimes it's difficult. Um, but uh, Bill Thompson's getting angry and he's saying, you should tell them it's false, right? You should tell them it is false. And he's like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell them it's false. And I actually see kind of it both ways. I think it'd be kind of weird if you're telling them that it's false, then you're kind of an, are you an authoritative figure doing that? Um, but Thompson wants them to know that it's false. So they're not being prejudiced. So I kind of get it from his point, but I don't think it makes sense for somebody to tell them it's false as you're asking them this question. I'll back it up just a little so we can hear it a little better again. Are you suggesting I follow up? Have you read, seen or heard it? He stalked it. Oh, by the way, if you know that, let me tell you, it's not true. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm suggesting, because isn't that exactly what happens in the voir dire process? No. Absolutely it does. Your Honor, I'm going to object argumentative. Okay. Yeah, you don't get to testify exactly about that. He's so. like, absolutely it does. Lawyers aren't allowed to testify. I'll sustain. Dr. Ellen, have you participated as an attorney in voir dire in Idaho under Idaho laws? By what? Have you participated as an attorney in voir dire, conducted voir dire, criminal case in Idaho? Yeah, so I they're have. they're arguing about what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do in voir dire. And I got to be honest, Thompson's been practicing for like a million years. 
Um, I think he knows how it works and what you can and can't say in voir dire. And I guess you can say, and I was trying to think of a Florida equivalent. You probably could say, you know, this isn't true. Uh, we absolutely were allowed to do that in a case where there was high media publicity in federal court, um, where we individually voir dire the witnesses. I don't think I usually say that in my case is like, actually, I do say certain things are not true. It's not always facts of the case. So, I mean, I, I would say you can say that this witness is saying you can't, I think he's wrong. And again, just like you got to be careful about arguing with an expert witness about their expertise, probably got to be careful about arguing with a lawyer about the law. If you're not a lawyer, um, even though he's done a lot of research and knows a lot about these cases, but I do think Thompson was right about that point. And he, um, made it a point to say, uh, you can't practice in Idaho, right? You've never picked a jury in Idaho. And just to be clear, because um, in two places at the beginning and at the end of your testimony and your PowerPoint, this PowerPoint, you, you created that as Ms. Taylor. Right. So you adopt the, what, the contents of the PowerPoint. Yes. yes. Oh, thank you. Um, just to be clear, not every I'm going to jump ahead a little bit kind of fumble around with these questions for a minute. Came from the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that true? That's my characterization of the nine questions. We know which ones we're talking about. Not all of the representations in those questions came from the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that true? That is true. Yet earlier from Ann Taylor, it really sounded like all the questions came from the probable cause affidavit. But now he's confirming that they did. Now they came from extrapolation sometimes or people picking something and running with it. But there were some things that just seemed to not be on there at all. And are you aware that under Idaho law, probable cause affidavits in criminal cases become open to the public by operation of court rule once a person is arrested and appears in court? I'm sure that's true. I'm just not used to having press conferences to tell the media to disseminate the information far and wide. Oh. So that was a little shot at Bill Thompson. He's like, yeah, I'm sure it becomes public, by the way. That's like officially public record. Um, but I'm not used to state attorneys having a press conference saying to disseminate it far and wide. So again, taking a shot at Bill Thompson. Um, Donna, yeah, I, I I get you. I get you there. I first heard about BK stalking Kaylee from the Gonsalves family on national TV. The family got that info from the cops, and now we know it's false. I don't know what's true or false, to be honest. I hear people still saying in the chat right now, absolutely this happened. He said one victim. It could have been all of them, or it could have been this one. It's like, okay, it's kind of proving his point. And people really think they know when they hear it, and it's hard to change their minds, even if the prosecutor says something. Uh, Olivia, hi from Poland. Don't know about others, but if they ask me, do you know about XYZ case? As soon as that calls over, I Google all about it. A hundred percent. I agree. I'm a lawyer, and I would do the same thing. Like, absolutely. Azam, this year is the best B-Day ever. Thanks, John and Peter. Happy birthday, Azam. So let's talk about that. That press conference was made prior to Mr. Coburn's appearance, prior to the release of the affidavit, and the press conference only referred the media to what would be part of the official court record. Isn't that true? I don't know. All I heard was, this is going to be released. I encourage you to tell your listeners and viewers and anybody who's interested in the truth. By going to the court record and looking at the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that true? I am recall you saying, I want you to go to the court record and look at the probable cause affidavit. And what it did was see... We're splitting hairs now, Doctor. That's fine. I don't have any other questions. Okay. Thank you. He's like, that's fine. I'm done. I'm done with you. And then redirect. I heard if David Nichols was convicted by a jury for murder. You could never do that in a white year because you'd be poisoning a well, just like in the John Fight case. Pretty much. Um, I rarely see during white year. This is him talking about how giving people false information could potentially poison the well, which is like kind of what he was accused of before that he had a big problem with. Somebody admits a comments on something like, oh, I read this. And then there's a whole discussion and explaining to everybody, well, that's not really true. That fact was just in social media. It's wrong. That is not a normal common thing that I've seen in one year. In your experience, 15 years, you said doing this work. Have you had a situation where you've been stopped midway through your process? No. What do you care about? What's what? What do you care about? I, I've heard you say, that whether what the media sends out there, whether 
all of those things are actually true or whether it's a spin off other information, that's not what's important to you. What do you care about in your work? What I'm interested in is assessing if there's prejudicial media coverage. Inadmissible prejudicial media coverage is some of the most concerning. Misinformation is some of the most concerning. What I care about is what extent of that stuff has permeated the jury pool, what do people know, and do those specific details generate bias, prejudgment? Again, I, I just, the idea that there can be all this stuff out in the public that's uh, misinformation, prejudicial, that benefits one side, and you're not allowed to ask if people know that detail because you might taint one person who already knows a whole bunch of information. But that, again, like knowing the, the, the detail about the stalking conduct. Okay, that person knows all this stuff, but that's the thing that's going to change everything. And now that person's poisoned because they heard it in a survey. But the fact that there's thousands of newspaper articles and television stories and comments on social media, um, 80% of people in this community have talked about this case according to the survey. None of that matters. It's because I did a survey and asked that question. I mean, that's just, I just, I don't even know. What to say. And, and I just, for him to be so like dismissive of that is really interesting to me because it almost flies in the face of what we do in most trials where we ask jurors these questions. We take their word for it and think and hope that maybe they're one of the juries that has never been in a car accident or doesn't have anybody in their family that's a cop or know anybody or close friends that's a cop. And they say these things and it's like, it's not perfect, but if you do find the one juror that hasn't read about this case or whatever, or didn't know about this misinformation, that's a good thing. We don't want to add people to the list of things that, are that that add people to the list who know things that are false. I, I mean, I, I I think that's interesting. Um, then we get to the judge's questions, which is potentially the most important part. He focuses on things not in the probable cause affidavit, which is leading me to where I think this is going, which we'll talk about at the end. And how do you balance people who do answer the phone and don't answer the phone? He basically said, we researched that and it's not really a big issue. Um, but let's let's jump ahead to where they do start kind of getting into it and what the judge thinks is important and wants to pull out of this witness. So if you did Ada County, it would be 400 and your confidence interval would be the same as it was here with a small anyway. So as long as it uh, is using the general concept of a randomized sample, you can generalize that population. So if I kind of interpreted this, uh, one of your answers just a moment ago about the, um, getting rid of the questions that are false, okay? That just came from the media that did not come from the uh, public. Uh, well, from the public, but not the legal part. Um, would you go away, go ahead with that and have legitimate data? So, so before he said, I'm not changing my questions. I'm doing it my way because it's the only right way. I respect him for that and I understand. The judge says, would it be possible for us to go forward, removing the questions that have information we know to be false. Okay, I think you have the nine questions. So if you look at it, are the other ones okay? Are you telling me there's two that you would like to exclude and keep the others? He's like, are you saying there's seven that are fine and two that are not? Seven? Well, me, I'm, I'm not, I haven't made a decision, but I'm just wondering if, I mean, at first in your testimony, you said, well, if we, if we can't, I can't do it without doing the same questions. That's a, that's one of the one of the problems, okay? The, the, the part of this argument. I mean, if if maybe it can be done without uh, sort of sending information out there that is false, that might in, you know affect people that are looking into that or thinking that it, it is they believe in it, even though they shouldn't. Um, is that something that can be done? Well, there's if you do it that way, you're, you're, there are potential compounds or things that will arise. Um, and again, I, the thing I struggle with, and I get, I understand the public record dissemination, so we've done this before. Um, the thing I get to is like, we're not really disseminating it, we're asking if people know about detail that has been disseminated through the megaphone of the media. So I'm really trying to just track what people know. I'm, I'm not trying to pass on information through a megaphone. So we're talking about 400 people that are talking to that of the county of five, you know, 500,000 or something, the, 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 the plus the, the risks and benefits of, of doing it that way. It seems like there's a very low risk of of undermining or contaminating the jury pool when you're doing that versus the risk of getting a, a huge black hole of, well, we don't know what percentage know this highly prejudicial detail. Um, 
like what are the odds of like the like impact is doing the survey going to have on the majority of the community relative to the media coverage is already out there. So do you ever do you ever put a caveat on the beginning of the questions where you say, well, uh, we want you to understand uh, as we go through these questions that uh, we're not determining guilt or innocence. We're not uh, we're not determining false or true. Uh, we just are interested in in our uh, your answer to our questions, and we uh, want to be careful that we're not sending out something that you are not going to understand. So yeah, so we do always there's an introduction, and there's there's no right or wrong answers to any of your questions. You can always say no opinion or I don't know to any question. Uh, it's going to remain anonymous. We're just interested in your views. So, so there's an introduction to that that section with the, those nine items. Usually it says you may have. Uh, we're going to go. Through. Seems like he's open to adding some of these introductions or wind ups or maybe ch <clears throat> changing what he already has. So maybe it's work. The media. Um, you may have already reported some of these already, but we're interested in what you've seen or heard. Um, we can add a caveat to that. Like some of these may not be true if that addresses it. Some of these things. It sure seemed like he did, Katie. Were not all these media items are actually accurate. Sure. People pick up the phone for something. He's saying stuff like maybe we could add that. We're going to ask if you've seen this stuff in the media. It doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate. Seems like a step in the right direction. And they think, you know, some, somebody with authority maybe, and they, they think, oh, well, this is, you know, this is really kind of the beginning of the trial or something. I mean, pe people misunderstand all kinds of things out there, right? So you can certainly tweak the intro. Now, we don't just jump into it. We don't say we're an authority. You know, it's usually... You know, no, I know you, you don't say that. I just think, you know. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we can work on the introduction if that would address some of those concerns so that people understand uh, not everything in the media is active. But the thing is, like, I would, if we're going to say, for example, not everything in the media is true, um, they get a lot of things wrong. You wouldn't, you, you would not want to say that before you do the prejudging march. You can do that after when you do the case specific items. Because I, I, what I want to know is what are people's opinions about guilt or innocence? I don't want to give them instructions and then get socially desirable response and survey. So basically, he doesn't want to lead them to say like what he wants them to say. He wants them to say the truth and what they actually think. Um, so after listening to this, it really is leading me to believe that judge judge is going to change the questions allowed. I think the survey is absolutely going to be allowed. And I think he's going to try to work in a way that this expert will stay on, still do these surveys, but either remove the misinformation or false information and probably add a better wind up explaining that they're not an authority. Not everything that's reported in the media is true. But we're going to ask you if you've heard about some of these things, or if they do leave some of the false information in, which I'd be surprised then they're going to have a bigger wind up like, you know, explaining this could be false or some of this is false. And I think I agree with that. I think I would allow more specific instances of this case, public record in the probable cause affidavit, because that stuff's going to come out in the trial. So if you've heard about this stuff already, you've heard media reporting on it, you already think he's guilty. You shouldn't, you shouldn't come in and be a juror on this case. So I think I'm actually more okay with some case specific stuff, but not stuff we know is false. I don't want to waste a single juror, let alone four. I know people can say that that's being overly conservative, but that's kind of how I feel on that. Um, then we hear arguments from the attorneys. Um, they say the survey is absolutely perfect the way that it is. Um, clearly arguing Latah County is biased. There'll be more arguments later. She argues the judge can't strike the 400 people. He says he was being sarcastic. She said she'll give him some grace. Um, they're privileged to represent Brian Koberger and they fully believe he's innocent. The state argues it's about the non-dissemination order and the survey violates it. Um, and Ron Mexico said that he has, this expert has worked in other cases with surveys, I'm sorry, non-dissemination orders, and it's been fine. And that's fine. I'm not saying he hasn't. Um, every case is a little different and have specific non-dissemination orders, but that's fine. I agree with you there. Um, the defense resents being told that they violated the non-dissemination order in their rebuttal argument. Thompson thinks that we can only do this survey if the questions are basically presented, state gets to give their objections, and the judge makes a call on what he thinks is right and wrong and should come in or shouldn't come in. There was one little two-minute clip I have here to play from the judge. I don't remember what he says, but let's see what he says here. Act that's, that's in the survey. The information that was put in the survey is based on the public record and information that the way that the state and state actors put information into the public record that has now been decided. I just disagree with that. We've already confirmed that's not true. And we have not violated that order. And I do resent being accused of that. 
I appreciate that. Um, I mean, those, those two questions were not in the public record. Okay. They were. I mean, they came out, but that that was not the not the uh, court. The the, the um, I mean, where it came from. It just came out of the media or somewhere. Who knows where it came from? But I don't think there's anything, not that I'm aware of, in the in the public record that said anything about that about your client. So, I mean, here we are. I mean, that happened. It's kind of unfortunate. Uh, I I totally understand uh, the the reason to have false information out there, but I mean, I I have to just want to clear that up. The other the other questions that's all from the public record. I have a question. It sounds like he's going to leave all the other stuff and he's just considering the two and he understands the need for the false information as I do too. I more understand it now after this expert. So if we're going to have it in, maybe we have a better windup that not all this stuff is true or we take him out. I, I kind of like where I feel like the judge is leaning on this stuff. Tim said, both sides seem to identify various information as true or false, but doesn't the truth itself need to be established through testimony or rebuttal? Well, I mean, the state kind of knows if certain things are false at this point. They don't all agree on what's true, but there are some things that sounds like they agree, all agree is false. Kyle, I wonder if this guy had to go through this in any of his other cases. Doesn't really sound like it. I'm sure he has. I'm sure there have been cases that have fought it before. Maybe not such high profile where he said he's watching on Zoom, like live people say this stuff about him, but I'm sure there's been other objections. Joe, is this expert supposed to be independent and objective or was he hired to demonstrate that Latah County is biased? And Taylor implies she knows the outcome. Same with the expert but he says he hasn't finished the analysis. Correct. And he was hired to determine if it is. They said that he has before done his analysis and said that change of venue is not appropriate. And he has said that he's been hired by the state and the defense. So he is unbiased at this point, hired by the defense, but you know, I don't know how people define that, but yes, he will determine whether or not it is. And, and Taylor basically says based on preliminary analysis and results, it's going to be, they're going to argue for change of venue that it's biased, but we have to wait till everything is done. And it seems like that's kind of where they're going at this point. April, if you still want to go to the Masters, I have two Saturday passes, no one will use, and one Sunday. Send me an email. Peter Tragos at greeklaw.com because there's not a lot of things I would drop everything for to go to, but the Masters might be one of them. Um, so send me that email. That would be crazy if YouTube had that kind of hookup. It's like a bucket list item. Um, but maybe one I thought maybe I'd never check off. So yeah, send me that email. Um, okay. That's all we got for our second live. I got to run. So I went over an hour. You guys are literally the best. We're going to continue following this. I love how you guys share all this, um, all your thoughts and questions to, to make this content so interesting and educational for all of us involved. Um, we're going to continue to do videos. Another Mew video is actually coming out tonight. Too many videos for one day, in my opinion, but make sure you guys subscribe and hit that reminder bell, please. We're continuing to grow there, continuing to bring new voices in. It's really fun to do that. And make sure you hit the like button on the way out. That's all I got. I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.